Hey guys, Tyler here. Transporters are a staple of Star Trek, a method of travel that converts matter to energy and back with the press of a few buttons. First appearing in the original series, the transporter was created to save money on visual effects, but it was so iconic that it was carried over into the next generation and the other spin-off series, including the prequel series Enterprise. As we see on multiple occasions, transporters can simplify away missions by eliminating the need for shuttlecraft, and in times of emergency, it can literally spell the difference between life and death. But this piece of technology, a monumental achievement in physics, no doubt, has nonetheless raised multiple questions over the years. How does it really work? Could we really build something like it in real life? And most important of all, is the person who comes out on the other side the real you, or a copy? Does the transporter kill you? Let's find out. Most intelligent species we see in Star Trek have one form or another of transporter technology. It seems to be a hurdle that most species cross not too long after they develop warp drive. The first human-made transporter was invented around the early 22nd century by Emery Erickson and implemented on starships by the early 2150s. In the decades prior, numerous people volunteered as test subjects, and quite a few of them were lost. Indeed, even until the 23rd century, most transporters were approved for non-biological use only. The transporter was a dangerous prospect when it was created, and even for centuries afterwards, it never completely shed the perception among numerous people that it was a death trap. But before we get into the transporter's implications on consciousness, we should first talk about its mechanics. Its quantum mechanics, if you will. Yeah. At a basic level, the matter transporter works by breaking down the atomic structure of an object or living being and reassembling it in another location. This stream of subatomic particles is called a matter stream. The coordinates for the destination are established by setting a transporter lock using targeting scanners before the matter conversion even begins, during pre-sequencing. The transporter signal that points to this matter stream is then transferred to the pattern buffer where it is temporarily stored before moving to the emitter array. As we learn in the TNG episode Relics, a transporter pattern can remain stored in a pattern buffer for an indefinite amount of time although the signal can degrade unless the buffer is left on a continuous diagnostic cycle. In this way, the pattern buffer is like a solid state drive with what I can only assume is an ass load of uh, internal capacity. One thing that is confirmed in relics, when the matter stream is in this disassembled state in the pattern buffer, the person in question does remain slightly conscious, although their perception of time and distance is incredibly warped, so to speak. Following this, the matter stream is transported to its destination across a subspace domain, meaning that the matter energy conversion not only involves our three spatial dimensions, but also extra dimensions. The exact nature of subspace is, well, rather complicated. It's a subject that I probably will explore in a future video. Just think of it as a special quantum field that links two points in space-time, much like how starships can travel faster than light without breaking the rules. Once the stream arrives at its destination, it rematerializes with all the quantum information intact. And, of course, the process is entirely painless. Okay, I just threw a bunch of technobabble at you, but what, if any kind of real-world physics, is this based on? Well, this might surprise you, but teleportation actually is a thing in real life except only on very, very small scales. For years, we've been able to transmit quantum information from uh, one location to another without physically moving any particles. Such quantum information, including the quantum states of individual photons, electrons, and even entire superconducting circuits, has been teleported as far as 1400 kilometers. This is achieved through the use of quantum entanglement. Because the information being sent is still subject to classical physical laws, this teleportation cannot occur faster than light. Yet. 
But while scientists have been able to entangle objects as large as diamonds, the actual teleportation of macro scale objects is still quite a ways off. So yeah, I, I did lie earlier, but it was to make a point. In order to master macro scale teleportation, we'd need to be able to conduct engineering on the scale of quadrillionths of a meter. This would allow us to work directly with the finest known structures of matter, such as quarks and strings, to manipulate the properties of atoms. This kind of engineering is called femtotechnology, and it is six orders of magnitude smaller in scale than nanotechnology. In his 1999 book, The Age of Spiritual Machines, famed futurist Ray Kurzweil predicted that humanity could cross this threshold by the year 2110, about a decade before Emery Erickson invents the first operable transporter, science. But aside from experiments with quantum teleportation, where, again, particles themselves are not moving but rather information, has there been any research to suggest that classical teleportation and the pop culture sense is even physically possible. Well, in 2016, Yu Shan Wei published a paper claiming, yes, it is possible. He likened particle teleportation to the transfer of electrons in a superconductor. An example of superconductivity is a levitating magnet cooled with liquid nitrogen that is repelled by an electric current freely flowing over its surface. This complete ejection of magnetic field lines within a superconductor is called the Meissner effect and can only be explained using quantum mechanics. Previously, in 2008, Masahiro Hota proposed that it may be possible to teleport energy by exploiting the quantum energy fluctuations of entangled vacuum states. In English, basically, that means that we could transfer energy from one place to another by raising or lowering the energy state of individual points in space-time. This kind of vacuum fluctuation shows up in real life as virtual particles, which pop in and out of existence very quickly but have large enough wavelengths to to affect macroscale objects. This is most evident in the Casimir effect, in which virtual particles cause two metal plates, nanometers apart, to come together seemingly spontaneously. Thus, if we're able to manipulate the properties of subatomic particles and we're able to transfer energy from one place to another through the quantum vacuum, then boom, we've got a matter energy transporter, do we not? Well, perhaps. Theoretically, there are a few things that could get in the way, such as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which states that the position and momentum of a particle cannot both be precisely known at the same time. Of course, Trek transporters have a built-in component called a Heisenberg compensator. How does it work? Well, according to art supervisor Michael Okuda in an interview with Time magazine, they work just fine. Besides, the uncertainty principle is what gives rise to the confirmed existence of quantum vacuum fluctuations, the very mechanism that could allow macro-scale teleportation under our current understanding of physics. Emphasis on current. In fact, the problem of Heisenberg compensators being magic and having no basis in real-world science is honestly a made-up issue. It's a misconception. Indeed, as quite a few observers have pointed out, Heisenberg compensators could work within the uncertainty principle rather than around it. That is, the compensator part of the name would be less about circumventing the laws of physics, but rather embracing what we know about quantum mechanics. The exact position and momentum of every particle in your body may not necessarily need to be preserved with perfect accuracy during a transport cycle. Only enough reasonable certainty that your most vital systems, including your thoughts and memories and your vital organs, remain as fully intact as possible and less critical systems are allowed a higher degree of uncertainty. This could explain why when Erickson tested the first transporter on himself in the early 2120s, after rematerializing, he immediately lost his lunch, presumably a kink that was later worked out. So given this emphasis on preserving thoughts and memories as accurately as possible, is it true that your consciousness is actually destroyed and recreated on the other side? Well, based on everything we've just gone through, I'm gonna go ahead and say no. 
Remember that proposal I referenced earlier that suggested that uh, energy could be teleported by exploiting quantum vacuum states? Well, while there is quantum entangling involved, such a proposal is distinct from the information transfer of a quantum state in quantum teleportation. Again, in quantum teleportation, it's really about transmitting instructions for the arrangement of systems rather than moving particles themselves. Attempts to describe macro-scale teleportation aim for a method of moving matter from one place to another and leaving nothing behind. In Star Trek, they've presumably figured this out. TM. The transporter, especially after the 22nd century, is a commonplace device used on a daily basis by millions of people. Transporting really is the safest way to travel. The Federation wouldn't rate something like this safe for biological transport if they knew for a fact that it killed you instantaneously or if the uncertainty surrounding this was too high. Besides, reports of the transportee remaining conscious throughout the transport cycle, the fact that the matter stream is a continuous stream of particles that is not interrupted, and the fact that matter cannot be created nor destroyed are all arguments against the death trap hypothesis in my opinion. There is no deliberate manufacturing of a copy. That is, in a regular transport, there aren't two entities that exist simultaneously, just one, and nothing's left behind except for some ionizing radiation. Duplication accidents, like the creation of Thomas Riker, are usually because of outside interference. In his case, a second confinement beam was reflected back onto the surface of Nirvala 4 through a distortion field. But here's a curveball for you. Even if it did kill you and create a copy, would it actually matter? No, I'm, I'm dead serious. Pardon the pun. We don't exactly know what consciousness is, but our best understanding suggests that it is a property that arises from the very electrochemical processes that power our brains. In a way, you are your brain. Brain and brain! What is brain? But even if we take the soul, into account, since Star Trek does make room for something like this, the katra, the essence of consciousness, then certainly the katra must move along with all the other particles during a transport cycle, since it is made up of energy, supposedly. But the continuous experience that our brain creates is an illusion. Our present is actually informed by our memories in a very literal sense, since it takes time for light hitting your retinas to travel back to your visual cortex and be processed by other parts of your brain. If the entity that is you exists in one place and a copy rematerializes in another, you just wouldn't know. You wouldn't know and neither would they. Much like what happens after death, at least given our current scientific understanding, you just wouldn't know. Okay, but enough theorizing. We won't get an actual answer until we put this to the test. That's right, I'm going to transport myself right here, right now, on camera for you, using a transport of my own design, based on some blueprints that I got from this guy on the dark web, but th that part doesn't matter. If this goes well, which I hope it does, it will be the first successful transport of a human being a century before they do it in the Star Trek timeline. Come on, let's make history. Here goes nothing. Energize. Oh. Crap! You want to do the outro? Uh, you, you wrote it, you can do it. We were the same person a few minutes ago. I, I don't care, dude. <sighs> Alright, whatever. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope that wasn't too much existential dread. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. I'm interested to hear your thoughts in the comments. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even our. further, if you want to support our work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those as well as our our social media and merch store this is going to take some getting used to are in the description. That's all I have for this we. week. That 
Live long and prosper. Are you happy now? You're gonna have to pay rent, you know that, right? <laughs> <laughs>